being an entrepreneur can be a lonely place. Most businesses don't even get past the first three years. So in this series, we're going to be talking to entrepreneurs that are high performing or high performing businesses that can help you with hints, tips and hacks to help you fast forward your way to success. My name is Mark Burgess. I've got over 20 years experience working as an entrepreneur, building up various different businesses. I've wrote a best selling book, I speak nationally and internationally at different conferences and this is Raising Your Game. I'm really excited about today's episode of Raising Your Game. I'm with a lady called Julia Lancrea. So Julia built and exited a pop-up retail business that worked in the UK, Germany and Russia. And she now teaches leadership teams how to be awesome. I've worked with Julia in the past and she's had a profound effect on me and my business. Hope you enjoy it. Okay, Julia, thanks for coming in today. I know you've got a mega busy schedule. Um, before we get into things, are you all right just to give the viewers a bit of a background on yourself and let them know who you are? Well, first of all, my accent always throws people. So I'm American born, but I've been in the UK for 20, almost 21 years now. And uh, in 2001, I started a business here in what's now known as pop-up retail. And then I was in shopping center real estate doing commercialization. And I realized that I could actually go out and possibly build a business for myself in that. So I got made redundant and I started a business in 2001 called Retail Profile. Over 14 years, grew it, shrank it, we did fundraising with VCs, um, got the VCs out, did a trade sale, brought the right private equity in, um, grew it in both Europe and Russia. So we did a licensed partnership in Russia with that same concept that we were building in the UK. And then also did one in Germany, built a business in Germany. So same concept, three different places, which was very interesting because of all the cultural differences. Um, but yeah, grew that and then we merged it with a, pub, a publicly listed company on AIM in 2010. And I stayed for four and a half years in that combined business. They were an experiential marketing agency. Mm -hmm. And then the left when my equity partners left in 2014. So big wow. journey. So what do you do now? So when I was deciding who I was going to be without my business, because that's kind of a big thing for if you're an entrepreneur, your identity is really tied up in your business. And I was trying to see what was my next phase. And I really loved working with entrepreneurs. I'd been a trainer in a nonprofit organization. And I just was hanging out with a lot of entrepreneurs in a peer group called Entrepreneurs Organization. So I thought, what am I going to do next? And I got this book given to me in 2010 called Traction by Gino Wickman, and I read it, and I realized that if I would have done everything that that book said, I would have got a higher multiple for my business when I had merged and sold it. Right. So I thought, this is it. I've got to learn how to do this, one, and then two, I want to help other business owners. So that's what I've been doing since 2014. I trained as an EOS implementer, which stands for Entrepreneurial Operating System. It's a mouthful. Now I actually work with owners and their leadership teams to help them get what they want from their business. Wow. Having gone through all of that process, there's going to be a lot of business owners, uh, entrepreneurs watching the show. Um, you're getting called in to solve these problems all the time. So what's some of the most common things that people say to you where they just feel like, ah, oh, there's no answer to this problem? Mm -hmm. So I speak with entrepreneurs all the time, and sometimes they're very robust, like, oh, I've got it all, all handled, right? But other times when you really get them to calm down and you have a chat that's honest, you can say their frustrations. So one of the biggest frustrations is people and management of those people. It can be their partners. So sometimes there's partners that are in aligned. It can be their employees. It can be their team members. They don't have the right leadership team around them to help them build and scale a business. Mm -hmm. It can be a division of a business. It can be suppliers um, or it can be a part of a business. So people is a really big frustration and it's also our number one asset. Yeah. So it's kind of that whole, whole thing. You really got to figure that out. And I'm guessing for most businesses um, that feel that frustration, um, even if they're small, but certainly as they become sort of medium or even large size, they probably get to the stage where they feel like it's, they're so deep entrenched in it, they couldn't even begin to figure out how they would turn that stuff around. So how do, how do they even begin to start looking at that? So we have this thing called when we're working in it versus on it in the business versus on the business. And what we help entrepreneurs to do and entrepreneurial leaderships to do is to step back away from the business and get a force for the trees viewpoint at it. And so one of the first things we do is we sit down and we do what we call a 90 minute meeting. 
So it takes about 90 minutes. And in that 90 minutes, we can transfer all the knowledge, information, show them the tools, show them the process, so they can make an informed decision to see if it is right for them or not to implement an operating system. And I'll just talk a minute about operating systems. They're actually quite trendy now. There's a whole bunch of people out there developing operating systems to run your business on. Mm -hmm. And so the one that we have is called the Entrepreneurial Operating System. It's a system to operate for entrepreneurs. In this 90 minute meeting, we show them, well, there's four things. We talk a little bit about me, so you know my background, and also the systems, you know we're not practicing on you. The second thing we do is we turn the tables and find out more about that business. So where they've been as a business, where they are today, and where they want to take the business. And we hear from all the people around the table of the leadership team. And then we show them the tools. So we have tools in what we call a toolbox, that if we can implement those tools in a business and get them strong, then the business is just more fun, easier to manage and scale. And then we have a proven process to take teams through to get the results that we get. Wow, okay, so they're supposing that someone's watching this and they're thinking to themselves like, wow, yeah, I mean, I just, I'm not sure about my team. I think they're what let me down. Um, do you think that most business owners uh, are right with that point of view? Or do you think that actually they probably need to just take a closer look at the way that they're working and the way that they've set up the business? Or Yeah. You know? So I think it's a little bit about both what you've said. So first of all, it's about how do we structure the business? So where are we are in the life cycle of the business? Are we just after startup? How many people do we have? Um, how much complexity is in the business? So one of the things we do is we work with teams 10 to 250 employees. So a person that's got 10 people in the business is going to have a smaller leadership team around them, mm -hmm. but they're going to have to start developing systems and processes and get more specialized, the people around them. They can't do everything because the business is going to grow a little bit beyond their reach. So we call this where businesses grow and then they hit a ceiling and then they try to grow again, but they can't, they get stuck. So it's typically a structure or a system that's not built for that size of the business. Mm. So what we do is we help businesses, whatever, wherever they are, to come in and show them where they are and then what they need to do to get unstuck, as, yeah. as we would, to then start growing. And sometimes it's the structure of the organization and the people they have around them or lack thereof. Do you think um, that a business should have people that only do one very specific thing? Or do you think that uh, it should have people that are able to easily dip in and out of, other, of, of lots of different things? That's a great question. In the beginning, everybody does everything because yeah. we just have to get it, get it done and get it scaled. Eventually, we have to start getting more specialized. So we have to have somebody that's going to be accountable and responsible for sales and marketing. Mm. Somebody that's accountable and responsible for operations, which is delivering the product and the service that we offer. And then somebody accountable and responsible for our both like financial and administrative functions. Mm. So as the business grows, we have to make sure that we're structuring at least those three departments and the person that's what we call the glue mm -hmm. we call them an integrator that harmoniously integrates those three functions yeah and we customize from there for that business what we call an accountability chart thank god for integrators everybody yes. needs integrators right especially if you're a visionary <laughs> yeah. okay so yeah. what we found because you know we did we did some some work together and, and what we found was um or what i found in my own head tell me if this if you agree with this or not maybe you don't you start the business on your own Right, so so you do everything. Um, your your hands are in all all the different pies, and then you employ staff just because you can't cope anymore, and you tell the staff to do what you were doing. So they just basically do the tasks that you made up, and they don't take any real responsibility. I mean, they take responsibility, but they'll always check: Did I do this right? And and you grow and grow that way, and then for us, one day you sort of realise. It's still just me working in a bedroom, really. No one has come to this with any new ideas, and they're too scared to because it's still my ideas that I had when I was working in the bedroom. And then we sort of flipped to the point of, let's have some specialist people where we can say, well, you look after customer experience, so you don't need to ask me. Like, whatever you think is right, go for it, implement it. If you think it's the best way of doing it in the world, go for it. And we found that was a great moment for us, but then those people end up uh, doing the same thing. They they get overwhelmed and they tell people how to do it. So how does it, what, what happens after that stage? So in the beginning, they're still looking for direction from you. And then you're training somebody and somebody becomes a specialist or expert in that. And then you're saying, okay, now you run that department or that division. And you're saying, what's, 
what's the next step after they get overwhelmed? I am. However, I know that we've got to go to a break. Okay. So hold the answer. Okay, great. And we'll answer it after the break. Don't go away. Okay, welcome back. So, just before the break, uh, we started to talk about uh, how, you, how a business develops from being just a solo entrepreneur uh, into a team that does what he wants them to do. And then eventually you realize that you should get the team to do stuff because they're probably better than you at it. You employ better people than you. Mm -hmm. And then that, that leadership team, if you like, get caught up in the day-to-day -day and they start employing people to just do what they said. And no one's really... You go back to the idea that no one's got any initiative, no one's driving anything forward. Maybe you've got people in the organisation that maybe don't match your core values or, or you're not quite happy with. Like how, do you, how do you manage that whole thing going yeah. forward? People component in EOS, we say right people, right seats. So there are two things you need to make sure you get right for the leadership team, and then once the leadership team's right, the entire organization. And the first one is right people. And we define that as someone that matches your core values. So you do a discovery exercise to find those core values. You articulate them and perpetuate them. And we want you to hire, fire, review, reward, and recognize around them. So you need to first look and see, are the people that you put around you, that are now your leadership team, do they match your core values? The second thing is to the right skill set that you need for the size and the scale of your business. Mm -hmm. So we use this really simple acronym called do they get it, do they want it, and do they have capacity? We call it GWC. Mm -hmm. So get it is do their neurons connect when you have on your accountability chart the five roles and responsibilities that they must deliver? Do they connect? Do they get those ins and outs of that, those roles and responsibilities? Mm -hmm. Second is, do they want it? Are they happy and willing to come in every day with a smile on their face and do that job for the compensation you're offering? The last one's a little bit trickier, but it's capacity. Do they have the mental, physical, spiritual, emotional capacity to do the job and enough time? And so when we use these really simple tools and apply them to the leadership team, once we get the structure first, we say structure first, and then we're going to actually people analyze into that structure. Mm -hmm. And that can help to determine if those people are kind of just doing the day-to-day -day and just barely keeping their head above, above the water line. Or can they really actually, what we do, say, lead, manage, and hold accountable? Because they need to actually keep delegating and elevating to their unique ability so that they can keep pushing things down and have enough room to actually manage and lead their department, their okay. division. Most companies that I meet, they, they believe they have core values. They have a thing on the wall and there's like 11 things. It's like the 12 commandments or the 11 commandments or whatever you want to call it. What's the difference between that and, and real core values? That's my, that's my first question, so let's okay. go on that. So a few tips on core values. They're a little bit over-tried, over-trodden. They say put a committee together if you've got 50 people, put them in a room, get them sticky notes for three days, and out pops the core values. And so with the entrepreneur operating system, we believe they come from the founder, and they come from here, and they're already there, but we just discover them. And so once we do that, we articulate them. And it's usually less is more, three to five, sometimes six, but three to five priorities that are not permission to play you and everybody else. It's something that makes you unique. And no two businesses have the same core values. So less is more, three to five, and then you want to articulate them. Once you know those, it's not just putting them on a poster on the wall. It's that the leadership actually leads and exhibits those. And then everybody in the organization is also. We're trying to catch people doing things around the core values that are right. And we praise in public. But then when they're not, we tr criticize in private. We take them aside and say, hey, that's not our core values. That's not how we do things around here. Yeah. So we want to attract people like us and repel the people that aren't. And then we can get everybody in the organization making decisions around the culture, the core values, because we all fit. We all get it. We all kind of match. Yeah. And that's the first thing to get everybody aligned. The second one is then those, that skill set. How do you stop people from coming up with core values that are just too vanilla? So we use filtering mechanisms and we say if they're aspirational, you would love to have it, but quite frankly, you don't. We filter them out. If they're accidental, they got there, but they probably shouldn't. They don't serve us today. Or the last one we call is permission to play. 
So here's an example, trustworthy. I gotta have people with integrity, gotta have people that are trustworthy. And when you're interviewing, if you get an inkling or if you check a reference and you realize that somebody's not trustworthy, you're just not gonna hire them. Mm. So that's a, a minimum standard that you probably don't have to have as a core value because it's something that's just gonna happen regardless. So the core values really actually are customized to you and really articulate the personality and how we act, think, and do in the business. You sit down and you, you figure out your core values. Um, and you think, oh, I've, I've got it now, I understand this. You lay all that out and you find uh, some of your staff don't have those core values. Then what? So there's a little bit of a combination of right people, right seats. Now I'm gonna give you four. So you have right people, right seats, and they match and it's great and usually they're great performers and if you give them the tools, resources, time and attention, they're gonna perform for you because they wanna do a good job. Second thing is they're right people, so they have the core values but they're in the wrong seat. They just aren't suited for the, for the roles and responsibilities, then you wanna move them to a different seat because if you have 25 people, you've got another seat for them. Mm. The next one is wrong person, right seat. They're doing the right job, but they don't match our core values. So that's a wrong, wrong person. That's the person we're gonna actually say, don't keep in the business. They're gonna do more damage than good. And then the last one is wrong, wrong. Wrong person, wrong seat. Again, same thing as number, number three. They're gonna do more damage than good. People are gonna be like, well, if George gets away with it all the time, why should I do it? And it just causes havoc with our standards and our quality and the way we do things around our business. So those last two, we have to be really strong individuals and be like, I need to help you find the next right company because this is not right. We're not right for you, you're not right for us, how can we make sure that we get you to that right next company? We're doing a disservice to keep those people in our business because one, they're hurting our culture and two, we're keeping them from finding their right business. But what I've found, that becomes <clears throat> relatively easy to do when people join your company after you figure this stuff out. What about for, com for people that are listening to this and they go, wow, this is great and they implement it and then they've got somebody who's worked for them for four, five, six years, um, and they look and they go like, oh, they don't have our core values. Um, still, would you say like, they gotta go? So loyalty is a big thing, and there's less loyalty today because people are moving jobs quicker and quicker and want different experiences. When you have something that's been loyal to you and you find they're not matching your core values, you need to sit down and give them the opportunity to show them what it looks like for them to match and give them three examples. Mm -hmm. So here's our core value. Here's three examples of how you're not meeting this core value. And then the next 30 days, I need you to try to change your behavior. This is one of the things I think we talked about. I used to think tigers can't change their stripes, right? But today, if we give people an opportunity and say, here's what the behaviors we're looking for, here's the behaviors that are not acceptable in our culture, give them the opportunity to change and see. Now, if you do that, strike one, strike two, strike three, then you still have this obligation to make sure that they get out of the business. But first, give them the opportunity to try to show them what you want them to look like and then see if they can perform. Wrong person, right seat. Yep. <clears throat> Maybe you've got uh, see if I've got a good understanding of this. Maybe you've got a, a sales guy. He does 200% of his target every month, uh, but he does not meet your core values in any way whatsoever. What, what do you do? He's, he's really annoying everybody around him. When people come in, there's dissension. There's, you know, he's, he, he's not nice to everybody. He puts himself above everybody else. So that sales guy who's actually really super performer, but it's just annoying everybody around him, he's gonna be doing more damage than good. And that's hard to do in the beginning, but once you get him out, the people around you will be like, what took you so long? Mm -hmm. He was just really so not fitting. It's a scary move, I guess, for a business though, isn't it? Yeah. Everybody in the organization has, a, has an impact on the revenue, but a salesperson specifically, who's bringing in money and, you know, you've said, you know, I want you to, I don't know, we want, we're, we've got a commitment around self-development. It's one of our core values. And he's like, yeah, well, whatever about, you know, I'm doing the sales. Yeah, I know it all already, right? <laughs> or I'm not changing. <laughs> yeah. So there is a tool we call the people analyzer. And it's this black and white tool that we can actually sit down and show him and have him evaluate himself and him evaluate you, the direct report and then you do the same thing. And again, it's just showing them what we're looking for. If they can't get there, then we have to do that tough decision. And this is this whole thing about short-term gain versus long-term damage. Mm -hmm. We have to look at, okay, maybe he made the numbers this quarter, but what's the underneath impact he's having on the organization as a whole? Yeah. So let's say it's your business, right? You've built phenomenal business, you run, uh, you help phenomenal businesses and help businesses turn into great businesses. But this is your business. 
you're a small business, you're 20 people, um, you, you step in and your sales guys don't meet your core values. There's maybe three sales guys, let's just say, for argument's sake, you've got three sales guys, one of them meets all your core values. Mm -hmm. And he's a, he's a mid-range performer. Uh, two of them are your top performers, they don't meet your core values whatsoever. Mm -hmm. One of them's not that great and he doesn't meet your core values. What do you do? Give me a tough scenario. <laughs> so first of all, we're not gonna fire everybody at once. We don't wanna knock the business over, right? So we wanna do this gradually, we wanna give everybody a chance. And it's first on us to communicate what our expectations are and show them what good looks like and show them what we want them to do, both mm -hmm. in behavior and also in performance. So the first thing is we've got to get that right. We have to structure the department and make sure the department head is good at leading, managing, and holding accountable, but then making sure that we're communicating to them what it looks like for behaviors in terms of teamwork, mm -hmm. teams of working together and how we treat our customers and our, and our um, team members, but then also performance that it's not just about the numbers because if we're just numbers oriented but not culture, we're gonna perform, but it's not gonna be a great place to work and you're gonna have a lot of turnover. So we wanna get both of them right and then I would do performance plans for each one of them and then I would see in that performance plan when the right time is to either replace and or see if they're gonna turn themselves around. And, they, and, and just very quickly, they say, uh, yeah, I, I didn't take any of the stuff on board, but you know, I'm still hitting my target. Yeah. What do you do? So I'll give you an example. I had a client once where he was a manager and he was performing, but he sent an email out to part of the staff and not all the staff and said, only part of you can come to this party, right. only the other half can't. And they went and said, look, that's just not how we behave. We're inclusive here, we're a team. Mm. If you're trying to pick and choose and exclude some people, we're just gonna part ways. And they were able through their human resource department and through legalities to show how this wasn't a behavior that was in keeping yeah. with, the, with the core values and was able to get them that yeah. person out. So it's not always just about the numbers. Yeah. Um, and again, it's gonna be harder to get somebody out of the business that's performing but acting inappropriately, yeah. but that inappropriate behavior can be called up. But ultimately, forgetting the legal side of things that yeah. people obviously have to look into, uh, that it's, it's, it's black and white, really. If they meet the core values, they can stay and they can perform and if they get the job and if they don't over and you've given them the opportunity, then yeah. there's no they, future. But they fit, like I have a person that I work with and she's just a delight and a joy to work with. I trust her 100%, she contributes to the business, she does what she says she's gonna do, um, she helps in ways that I never even know she's going to and that's what you wanna surround yourself with. So it's more about what we wanna surround ourselves with and then it's not always completely apparent when it's not but you can sometimes look at this tool and see if it's working or it's not. That's been awesome. Thanks so much for coming in. If someone has listened to this and they do want to reach out to you, what's the best way for them to do it? I think the best way to reach me is to go to my website, which is boldclarity.com. Awesome. Thank you very much. Thank you.